All right, let's begin. Welcome to CS 2050. Um, the topic of today is just elementary number, th number theory. So number theory, what is number theory? Number theory in some sense is like the queen of mathematics. It's like the oldest and uh, the oldest branch of mathematics. It's ancient. Some of the, a lot of the things, the theorems we're going to prove today are from the time of Euclid or older. They're, they're really, really old. Um, number theory also historically has been a very, very pure kind of mathematics. It simply involves numbers. It's about, you know, like logic was like P implies Q. Uh, number theory is like, what are the properties of one, the properties of two, the properties of three, the properties of four, the properties of squares, the properties of uh, multiplication, of addition, uh, of divisors, very simple stuff. Uh, there's a book by Warren Hardy called uh, Mathematician's Apology. And he was a mathematician during World War I. And he talks about how he had this opposition to World War I. And of the mathematics that he was allowed to enjoy, basically was, it was only number theory. Because no one had, for 2,000 years, no one had figured out how to apply number theory to make any, it's, to, it's totally uh, recreational. It's, it's all par parlor math in some sense. Uh, so he went into number theory simply because if you knew any advanced mathematics at the time, they locked you in a cage and they prodded you and forced you to compute like missile trajectories and stuff during World War I. So uh, escaping into number theory was like the way he was able to, it was, it was too pure in some sense to be dangerous. Um, unfortunately for him, number theory now is pretty, we can apply number theory pretty well. So two millennia of totally unapplicable theorems, 1970s somebody figured out some, some to make some use of, of this stuff. Uh, and that, we'll talk about RSA uh, and cryptography later for that reason. But number theory, you should think it's, it's very, it's, it's basically like little games and toys and puzzles, right? Um, so w when we talk about numbers, now we mentioned when in the set theory unit and the logic unit that zero was a natural. Now that I still maintain is true, but it's an annoyance for number theorists. So most of the time when we refer to a number, we mean, we mean a positive number. So some number, um, one or more, you know. Uh, division by zero is just sort of a headache. It just kind of incurs uh, some really bad uh, thoughts. So we sort of, we, for the most part, it's very context dependent whether or not we will consider zero as a case or not. Sometimes we will, uh, sometimes we won't. So, um, now we talk about this uh, integer division. We say uh, it's read as A divides b. To mean uh, a divides b is like a is one number, b is another number, and then a can sort of divide equally into b. What we mean by this is that there exists some c such that a c is equal to b. Right? So a divides into b basically means a is some factors of, of b in some sense, right? For example, 2 divides into 6. That's true. It's true because you should think there is a formal definition. There exists a C such that AC equals B. But also it's true because you could say, well, 2 does go evenly into 6, right? That's sort of intuitive. Uh, 7 does divide into 28, right? 7, 14, 20, and 28. C would be 4 there. Uh, 2 does not divide into 3. And we may say a number does not divide into another as we just put a strike through so this divides. This is similarly related to the division that you know, but not exactly. It's only slightly analogous. It's not exactly this one. It's an integer division, because we're in number theory land. We're not working with fractions. Fractions aren't real. Uh, number, number theory is about numbers. Um, again, you should think that uh, A divides B is true uh, if and only if like B over A is a whole number. Right, B over A, you don't have any leftover pieces. You're just a number, right? Uh, this is what we, what we mean when we say A divides B, right? Uh, pop quiz, uh, for what N is, does one divide into N? All N? 
Yeah, all n. Why? Just, if you go back to the formal definition, you choose a is 1 and b is n. Well, you choose c is n. So n equals n, you're done. Um, for what numbers n does n divide into 0? All n. All n as well. Uh, you choose c equals 0 for that one, right? All numbers divide into 0 in some sense. Uh, what about um, n, uh, p such that p is a prime number? What possible n can divide into p being a prime number? Yeah, the only divisors of a prime number are, by definition, a number is prime if its only divisors are 1 in itself. Um, so if some number n divides into p, then you must know that n is equal to 1 or n is equal to p. That's the only cases. Right? And you may also uh, observe for all n that n divides into n, right? Sort of trivially, right? Um, here's another one. What if you know that n divides into m and that m is strictly less than n? What does that imply about m? This one should take a second for us to think. N is a multiple of M. Wait. M is a multiple of N, but M is less than N. Can a number be a multiple of a number if it's smaller? If M equals N, suppose that M is strictly less than N. So it could be the case had I not had this condition, right? Suppose it's definitely not equal. Yeah. M equals zero. M equals zero. This is the only, if, if, m, if n divides into m and m is strictly less than n, then it must be the case that m is equal to 0. Why? Notice that these are all bigger. The b, a divides into b, the b is bigger, right? The smaller number divides into the bigger number. Makes sense, right? A bigger number can't divide into a smaller number. c here has to be a number. It can't be like a fraction. It can't be like 1 over 10, something like this. It has to be uh, a, a whole number, right? And for any number for that to be true, you have, a, you have to have a, if you have a small number here, you have a big number here, it must be the case that it's zero. Yes? This is all in the balance of positive integers, right? So when you deal with number theory, it's kind of like, uh, the universe of discourse is a little more fluid. So we won't rigorously, uh, in, in context, it'll be obvious if we're referring to zero being a number or zero not being a number. For example, we would not say zero is a divisor of anything, but we may say that every number is a divisor of zero. Something like this. Um, you just want to avoid obvious division by zero. And it, should be, it, it will be obvious from the context when to consider zero as a case and when not to consider zero as a case. This is the sort of headaches that zero consideration of zero does incur. But I argue it's, it's still necessary. Right. More questions on just this uh, the early definition? Yes? Can we replace like the there exists C with there exists one C because? Um, f with respect to definition, you're saying a unique C? Yeah, there exists a unique C. Uh, proving that is more difficult. So we'll take the definition as simply there exists C. Right, got yes. it. I'll also say that in general, like, um, uh, uniqueness is not usually required by definitions, even though it should be obvious. Because the uniqueness part is not part of the definition. It's proven in some sense. The existence is part of the definition. But yes, you should think that, there, in fact, there exists a unique C. Um, let's do some, uh, suppose that, um, uh, that A divides into B and, uh, A divides into C. This implies that A divides into B plus C, right? So if A is, A divides into B and then A also divides into C, then A should divide into B plus C. We'll prove this in a quick in a quick second using the, the formal definition. But before we do, convince yourself that it's true. Some number times a is equal to b, right? Some number times a is equal to c. So then a should divide into whatever the sum of those is because there are multiples of a, right? You can like sort of pull out the a, and that's basically what the proof is going to be, right? Questions on this before we prove it? We'll prove some very elementary facts about integer division. Okay, um, let's do uh, uh, if 
A divides into B by the premise, then there exists, let's say, D, such that uh, AD is equal to B. Uh, if uh, A divides into C, there exists, uh, let's call it E, such that AE is equal to C, right? Then uh, B plus C is equal to AD plus AE, which is equal to A D plus E. Agree? Uh, since uh, B plus C has A as a factor, A divides into B plus C. We can write B plus C as A times something, right? Also, another comment on the uniqueness. Notice that we didn't need to prove that, D, that this was unique in any sense. So delegating to the formal definition is just a, it's enough that there exists some C. The C here in the definition is this D plus E, right? QED. Questions on that proof? Kind of simple and elementary. Cool thing about number theory, all of it, for the most part, is simple and elementary. The proofs follow very cleanly, very directly. Questions on that one? Let's do another one. Um, if A divides B, uh, that implies that A divides BC for all C, right? Convince yourself that's true. A if A is a factor of B, then BC contains A as a factor as well. So let's just prove it with the formal definition. Uh, if A divides B, then uh, there exists, let's say, D such that AD is equal to B. So uh, BC is equal to ADC, which is equal to ADC, right? Uh, since A is a factor of BC, uh, A divides into BC. And this is true for all C. C even zero here. Question on that one. Also kind of direct and elementary proof. But again, notice how we're delegating to the formal definition uh, of division. But it, it, it maintains the properties that we would like. Right. Let's do one more about the transitivity. Uh, if A divides into B uh, and uh, B divides into C, uh, then A divides into what? Transitivity should be C, yeah. So if A divides into B, and then B divides into something greater, then A should divide into B, which divides into C, so A should divide into C. We're proving the transitivity of the relation, right? Um, how's the proof going to go? Super elementary. Once again, you just set it up, and the things fall right where they should. Um, if uh, A divides into B, then uh, there exists, we can't use C, so we'll use D, such that A, D is equal to B. Uh, if... Uh, B divides into C, then uh, there exists E such that B E is equal to C, right? Uh, then uh, C is equal to B E, which is equal to A D uh, E, right? Which is equal to A uh, D E. Uh, since uh, A is a factor of C, uh, A divides into C, QED. Great proof, elementary proof. Questions on this one? Such, such simple facts you can probably prove as well, right? Any, anytime you need, perhaps, if you think you need a fact about the uh, divides relation, you should probably just try to prove it. It would take you two seconds. Right. Questions on this proof? Awesome. Uh, let's do um, uh, something called Euclidean division now. Uh, uh, for all n uh, and for all d greater than 1, uh, there exists unique uh, Q comma R uh, such that 
um, uh, n is equal to dq plus r, right? At r and, and, oh, excuse me, and uh, r is an element of 0 to d minus 1. Okay. Cumbersome at first, but it's actually kind of obvious what's going on here. Uh, r is called the remainder. Uh, d is called the divisor. And q is called the quotient. We want to write n as dq plus r, uh, essentially so we can perform division of n, but an integer division. When you, take, when you divide a number by another number, you all, you'll get a rational number, right? But we don't want a rational number. Instead of having a rational number, we want to talk about a pair of natural numbers, q and r, to represent that, right? When you divide, let's say, uh, 23 divided by 7, right? Some people would say, oh, that's like this fraction. What is that? Three point something? Three point, I don't know. Um, it's more than 3.3 .3 something, something like this. Uh, but notice that you can actually write this as 3 plus uh, 2 over 7. Would you agree? 23 sevenths is 3 plus 2 over 7, right? That's the motivation by, by what's called this Euclidean division. We want uh, to divide n by d. So we want to take some number n and divide it by a divisor d. That's going to give us, if we can write n in this way, that's going to give us n q plus r, excuse me, uh, dq plus r over d, um, which is equal to dq over d plus r over d, which is equal to q plus r over d, right? So basically, when we divide n by d, we want to output some q comma r. We don't want to output some fraction. We want to output the q, this number, and we want to output the, d, the r, that number. That's the way we want to perform the division. You know, it's going to give us two numbers that, that work this way. Um, also notice, kind of obviously, why must r be less than d minus 1, less than or equal to d minus 1? Why is that true? Because then it will be divisible. divisible. Say it one more time. Then it will like overflow, I guess. Basically, I mean, yeah, like, so suppose r was like d plus 1. So then you have dq plus d plus 1. But that doesn't mean q is what it should be, right? It's not really unique. You could, if you had dq plus, let's say, d plus 1, you would actually have uh, dq plus d plus 1, which is equal to d q plus 1 plus 1, right? So there's a, different, there's a different pair that are the same number. You don't get the uniqueness, right? The, it, it does overflow. If, this goes, if the remainder goes above d, uh, then it literally will, you should rather increase q by 1 and then reset r back to 0, right? Um, we're not going to be able, with the tools we have now, we're not going to be able to prove that for all n, a pair qr exists. But with the tools we have now, we can prove uniqueness. The way that you prove that, a, so to prove the statement, you need to prove that a qr, for all n, that a q and r exist. And then you need to prove that a pair qr are unique, right? The way you prove that the, q and r ex, the qr exist is by proving the correctness of, a, of the Euclidean division algorithm. And I, it's a little cumbersome, and I think it will take us too long. So we're not going to prove uh, the correctness that for all n, there is a q and r. It should intuitively be true, basically, because a couple examples. You can always, for, for 23, you put the 7 there, you can always get the q and the r out. It's sort of trivial that you can do that. Um, proving the correctness of that is a little difficult. So we, we won't do it with the tools we have now. But we will be able to prove uniqueness, right? Now, how do you do, how do, you do a uniqueness proof? Contrapositive? What, what would the contrapositive be? That for a specific, or for a, there exists an n, and then there exists a d that's less than 1. And then, wait, I, I don't think the contrapositive is right. I'm always open to uh, new strategies about anything. 
but I think you, wanna, you always want to go with the easiest way to make the proof as simple as possible. I was talking with somebody else about this earlier today. He was like, he had a, there was some paper that was like a 100-page proof, and like three people in the world knew how to read it, and then somebody else in 2005 was able to make a 20-page proof. 20 pages is still a lot, but you know, everyone was cheering about that. Um, kind of the same strategy we want to do here. We want the simplest proof, even if contrapositive may be correct. Right? In general, how do you prove uniqueness? By contradiction, you say like there are two things, and then to show that they're the same thing. Yeah, so what we're going to do is assume to the contrary that, uh, assume to the contrary, uh, uh, there exists a Q R and uh, a Q prime R prime such that uh, D Q prime plus R prime is equal to N, but that's also equal to D Q plus R. You agree? So we want to assume to the contrary. When you do, when you do uniqueness, you assume to the contrary that um, two things exist, and then you show actually that they're equal. So we're going to conclude uh, we want to show to show that r is equal to r prime and uh, q is equal to q prime, right? If we can do that, then we, you should convince yourself that we've shown uniqueness, right? So suppose that uh, dq prime plus r prime uh, is equal to dq plus r, right? Uh, without loss of generality, Suppose that r is greater than or equal to r prime. Now, by contradiction, we're assuming that r does not equal r prime. So it's in fact, it should be r is strictly greater than r prime. Why, we, why without loss of generality, may we assume that? R was less than R prime, then we could we could switch them. Yeah, like it doesn't really matter. I mean, if two numbers are not equal, one must be greater than the other. So just suppose the one that we call R is greater than the one we call R prime. We are saying that there's two different uh, pairs: Q R, Q prime, R prime. But it doesn't really matter which one is Q R and which one is Q prime, R prime. One of them is Q R, one of them is Q prime, R prime. We just have to call them different things. So if two numbers are not equal, one must be greater than the other. So just suppose that R is the one we say is bigger, right? That's the, sort of where the loss of generality comes in. If dq plus R prime is equal to dq plus R, so we have dq prime plus R prime is equal to dq uh, plus R, we have that dq prime minus dq is equal to R minus R prime. You agree? Uh, this is then equal to d q prime minus q is equal to r minus r prime, right? So we, we see here that d is a factor of r minus r prime, right? So d divides into r minus r prime. But uh, R and R prime are elements of 0 to uh, D minus 1. So R minus R prime, so R uh, 0, R minus R prime is less than or equal to D minus 1, right? So R minus R prime is less than D. Yet d divides into r minus r prime. What does that tell you about r minus r prime? Zero. Yeah, this is a small number. This is a smaller number than this number, but this divides into this. It must be the case then that r minus r prime is equal to zero. So, r minus r prime must equal zero, and that implies that r is equal to r prime. Right? D a big number. R minus r prime small number. Big number divides into small number. That's only true if r minus r prime is 0. So small number is 0. It, that, it, that's how small it is. If r minus r prime is 0, then r equals r prime. Simple, right? Uh, if r equals r prime, 
if r minus r prime is 0, then we know that d q prime minus q is equal to r minus r prime, which is 0, which is just 0 here, right? From here, it applies, obviously, for d greater than 1, uh, that uh, q minus q prime is equal to 0, and that further implies that uh, q prime is equal to q. So we, know, so we see that qr is equal to q prime r prime. And we proved uniqueness. Questions on that one? Any, any questions on the proof writing on the steps? Notice the crux here was, of course, this argument. d divides into r minus r prime. That was the whole. From there, everything sort of trivially follows. It collapses down. If r, we prove that the r's are not unique. And then if the r's are not unique, then uh, neither can the q's. The quotients. Questions? Let's talk a little bit about modular arithmetic. Modular arithmetic, uh, sometimes it's called clock math. You are working with respect to a certain set, and there aren't any numbers outside of this. It's like a very small universe of discourse, and nothing else matters. So we say this, we use this notation uh, Zn to mean uh, 0 through n minus 1. And this is a uh, set. Later tomorrow, uh, Thursday, we'll talk about group theory. But this is a set of numbers. And basically, every number mod n is one of these numbers, right? So you can study a small set and have certain properties that the, all of the integers also happen to have, right? Uh, for example, uh, we say a is congruent uh, to b uh, mod n. If whatever a and b are, after you take the mod of them, map to the same element of uh, zn, right? When you mod a number out, it's going to fall between 0 and n minus 1. You agree? What is 13 mod 5? Are you guys familiar with how to compute a mod? Right? In, in like a, sometimes in a programming language, it may be done like this, right? 13 mod 5 is going to be what? 3. 3, right? So you do 5, 10, 13. So you see, basically, the, way, the best way to compute the mod is through, sometimes you can repeatedly subtract n from uh, the a, and you'll be left with your remainder, right? So, and this is equal to 3, and so on, right? If you take every number mod n, uh, it's going to be between 0 and n minus 1. So Zn is the set of possible values when you take the natural numbers and you mod them by n. So study of Zn, in some sense, can mirror the study of the naturals. Um, if you have, for example, uh, a uh, mod n plus uh, b uh, mod n, a is some natural number, you mod it by n, b is some natural number, you mod it by, by n, I claim that this is equivalent to, this is a triple equal sign. This means equal only with respect to the mod. So here, 13 is not the same as 3, but mod 5 it is, right? One way to come at this is that this equivalence is the definition of equality you, that you're using, and that there aren't any differences between these numbers. There really is 13 and 3, if you're working mod 5, are the same number. Anything you can do to one, you do to the other is identical. This is in a, like inequality. You know? It's the same thing. You're doing the same thing to the numbers. If you take a and you mod by n, you take b, you mod by n. I claim this is equivalent to a plus b mod n. Right? So addition, basically, mod n still works. If you have a plus b mod n, you can just a mod n, then you can take b mod n. Right? It works the other way as well. If you do, if you do a uh, mod n, times b mod n, uh, this is going to be congruent to what? a b mod n. Again, works about as, exactly as you would expect it to, right? Um, again, I'm using the word equivalent here to 
to mean like with respect to the mod. Equality is all defined with respect to the mod, right? A uh, one way to think about modular arithmetic is that if A is congruent to R uh, mod n, uh, this implies that there exists a K uh, such that uh, A is equal to Kn plus R. Okay. When you take a number and you mod it by n, in some sense, you're only left with the remainder. The remainder, as in with respect to the Euclidean algorithm, if a is equal to dq plus uh, r, and you take n and you mod it by d, you're left with r. Right? It's sort of the same thing here. And we'll prove the relationship between the, between the two in a second. r is the remainder. r is going to be a, zero, a number between 0 and n minus 1. Right? So when you mod, if, you say, if, if it's true that if you mod uh, a by n and you're left with r, then there was a k such that a k n is equal to r, right? Similarly, you can prove that like a plus n is congruent to a mod n, right? You can have uh, uh, some number of multiples additively of n in either one, right? Questions on this one? We'll do a proof to elucidate this a little closer. Like if you had like a, you're modding it by 7, and you get like the mod of a is 6 and the mod of b is like 5 um wouldn't that sum up to be greater than uh like 7 yes but uh a plus b is congruent to 6 plus 5 mod 7 what is 6 plus 5 mod 7? That is 11. But 11 mod 7 is what? 4. So 6 plus 5 is 4. Right? A little tricky for people to, 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 to think about, because 6 plus 5, you want to say 11. But when you say mod 4, it's understood, like the universe of discourse, what you, the elements you're talking about. 6 plus 5 is not 11. 6 plus 5 is 4. All right, let's prove uh, the following. If A is congruent to B uh, mod N, uh, this is true if and only if uh, N divides into what? And just, uh, this one's a tough one. I don't expect anyone to get this one, but let's see if you can. If A, if A is congruent to B mod N, essentially they fall into the same equivalence class. Essentially, a and b are the same number with only multiples of n, right? They differ in only multiples of n. n should divide into what then? A minus b. A minus b. Let's take a second to digest that. A and a, if a is congruent to b mod n, we basically mean that they have the same remainder when you take the mod of n. Whatever that r is, it's the same for both. Maybe it's 2 mod 7, right? Then a minus b is going to be like 7k plus 2 uh, plus 7l plus 2. And then so we take a minus b mod n, it's actually going to be the difference of the two. So it's going to be 0 mod n. So it's going to be, a, it's going to be some multiple of n. That's basically what we're saying here. The remainders, if the remainders are equal, when you take the difference, the remainders cancel out. You're left with 0. We could prove this, though. So of course, and if only if, we must prove this way. Uh, how are we going to prove it? Uh, uh, assume that A is congruent to B mod N. Uh, then uh, there is a K uh, such that uh, A is equal to uh, Kn plus B, right? Or that A minus B is equivalent to Kn. Since uh, n is a factor of a minus b, then n divides into a minus b. It's kind of simple on that one, right? You see how the remainders, uh, you're left with n on one side? Everything works out. Let's prove the reverse direction. I also say this is not like such a super important proof. This is not something that elucidates some deep theory about modular arithmetic, but it's just an exercise to relate uh, modular arithmetic to the division that we know, right? They're this, really the same. Uh, how do we 
prove the reverse, we're going to assume uh, let uh, n divide a minus b. Now we know by division, what does this mean? Uh, then there exists a c such that uh, nc is equal to a minus b. Why is that true? That simply follows from the definition of uh, division. a divides into b if there exists a c such that nc equals a minus b. Uh, then uh, nc plus b is equal to a, right? So a mod uh, a is congruent to b mod n. Take a, you mod it by n, that'll vanish. You're left with simply b, right? QED. Questions on this one? Again, a little cumbersome, but uh, kind of interesting. We related the two concepts. All right, I have one more theorem for you guys, and then we'll take a little break. It's called uh, the Fundamental Theorem of Arithmetic. Fundamental theorem of arithmetic, does anyone know the statement of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic? It's fundamental, so maybe you have, I don't know. It's, it, it's it pretty important. Um, uh, for all n greater than uh, equal to 1, n, excuse me, greater than 1, strictly greater than 1, n has a unique prime uh, factorization. A prime factorization is a way to decompose a number into a product of primes and only primes, right? A number is prime if its divisors are one and itself. And every number is noticed atomically, almost, like the way chemical, chemically you have atoms build up bigger molecules. Every number is actually built up of a product of prime numbers. Uh, for example, give me a sequence of numbers uh, that multiply to equal 135. Find the factorization of 135. Name one factor of 135. We'll start with there. Three? three? How'd you get that so fast? 45 times three. 45 times three? I, was, I saw five first. No, okay, so we know it's three. We know it's three and we thought it was five. I, I didn't get three out of that one. Okay, <laughs> it's three times five is what? Okay, so what are the other factors of uh, 135. 7 is a factor. 3, 3. So what is 3 times 3 times 5? 3 times 3 times 5 is 15. Is 15 times 3 is 45. Okay, so 3 times... We're not done. What's another factor of another 3? And I think that's it, right? So we may write 135 as 3 cubed times 5, right? The prime numbers are what? They're 2, 3, 5, 7. You skip 9, 11, 13, 15, you skip 15, 17, and so on, right? Lots of interesting numbers like this. Uh, one of the reasons that we don't want 1 to be a prime number is just because then every, then the fundamental theorem of arithmetic is not true, right? Why? Uh, 1 to the 100 uh, divides into n, and 1 to the 1,000 divides into n, right? So that's different factorizations of the same number. It's not unique. So we want to have a unique prime factorization. The way we may write this sometimes is that n is equal to the product of, let's say, i is equal to 1 to k of pi to the uh, ai, where ai is whatever the exponent is. So for example... Here's another one. What is 2 uh, cubed 
3 to the 1 times 5 squared. Let's see if you can get that one. That's 8 times 25. What's 8 times 25? 200. 200. All right. 25 times 8. Somebody plug that in a calculator. I think it's 200. Well, then times 300. Then times 3, yes. Ah, oh, there we go. OK. That is 600, yes. Awesome. Ah, yes, because you get a 10, and then you get a 6. OK, perfect. The, the point is you can write the number as a product of the primes and then with the exponent of the primes. So pi times ai, this is p2, p1 is 2, p2 is 3, p3 is 5, and so on, right? You can write every number as 2 to the power, 3 to the power, uh, 5 to the power, and so on. And including, uh, you can even have uh, 7 to the 0, and so on, right? 7 to the 0 is 1, so 7 does not divide into it. This is uh, 2 cubed, 3, 5 squared is what we would call a prime factorization of 600. It is the prime factorization of every number is, in fact, unique. Now, actually, ironically, again, we are going to do another uniqueness proof. We won't be able to prove existence because we don't yet have the tools. But we will be able to prove uniqueness. So uh, the existence proof basically says, assume to the contrary, like you can divide two numbers into two smaller numbers, a product of two smaller numbers, each of which are not uh, composite, each of which are not prime. Well, then they have factors, which themselves are not prime, and so on. So you get, uh, you'll get a proof by contradiction that way. We won't be able to do the, unique, the, the uh, existence because it, that every number has one prime factorization because it requires an induction step. I don't know how to prove it without induction. Maybe there's a way. Instead, we'll be able to prove uniqueness. So again, how do we... Prove uniqueness. Contradiction. Contradiction. We're going to assume to the contrary. N is equal to P1 to PK, which is equal to Q1 to QL. Uh, with uh, P1 to PK, Q1 to QL, all prime numbers. Right? Now, if we want to assume that the factorizations are different, we actually don't, it's not, an, we can even assume something weaker than P1 does not equal Q1, P2 does not equal Q2, and so on, because we don't know what the order of them is, right? It may be in the case that P1 equals P2 equals P3 equals 2, something like this, right? You can write it as the product of the primes, right? Uh, instead, we'll assume something even weaker, that there exists an I for all J, that pi does not equal qj. Some pi uh, does not equal any qj. That is the negation of the premise that we'll take. And it's much simpler than, the, than uh, it is. But that's sort of the heart of negation. It's not, uh, when you, if two things are equal and you take the negation, it doesn't necessarily mean that those two things are different. But it's how they're different. It's different in, in some sense in the weakest way. And this is a, a, our sufficient assumption to the contrary. Right? Some pi does not equal every qj, any qj, excuse me. Right? Questions on that on the setup of the proof before we continue? Yes? Why does the n equal p, p sub 1 all the way to p sub n is equal to p1 times p2 times p3 oh, okay. times pk. So that's supposed to be a product of primes. Let's say it's like 2 times 2 times 2 times 5. And let's say q1 is some other product of primes. Uh, 2 times 3 times 5 times 2. Something like this, right? Um, so they're just two different prime factorizations. They're whatever list of a product of primes, right? Something like this. Um, did that answer your question? Oh, OK, yeah. Um, so there exists some i such that there is some prime number that's not equal to any of the other prime numbers, right? So what do we know about this pi? Uh, so uh, since uh, n is equal to p1 times pk, and k and l are the number of primes in the prime factorization, 
uh, since n equals p1 to pk, pi divides into n. Do we agree with that? pi being, by definition, part of the prime factorization of n, pi divides into n. So, but n is equal to q1 times ql. So pi divides into q1 ql. Since pi is prime, pi divides into qj for some j. This is the heart of the proof. This is the this is the this is the 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 crux step, right? If q1 through ql are all prime numbers, we'll deal with that part in a second. But pi being prime means it divides into one of the into into one of those factors, right? If you have a set of them, that's some composite number. It can divide into one of the smaller composites, right? Um, this is not sufficient to reach a contradiction yet. Because the fact that one number divides into another does not imply that they're equal. We want to conclude that pi is equal to qj, not simply that pi divides into qj. But since qj is prime, what do we know? What do we know about prime numbers? Yes. Since qj is prime and pi divides into qj, pi either equals 1, not true because 1 is not prime, or pi must be equal to qj. Contradiction. Questions on the proof. It's called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Sometimes theorems are given big, broad titles like this because they are useful and appear very often. We will cite the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. It's a very powerful tool. The fact that a prime number, any number can be uniquely de decomposed into a product of primes is very powerful, surprisingly so. Even if you, de you decompose a number into smaller numbers, those numbers may decompose into smaller numbers, and those numbers may decompose into smaller numbers until you're left with a number that cannot be decomposed by definition, which is a prime number. Right? The prime numbers, in some sense, are like atoms for all of number theory. With the prime numbers and multiplication operation, you can enumerate all of the natural numbers, except one. So, questions on this proof? Yes? You go for that very first introduction. Right. So assume to the contrary, when we want to prove uniqueness, we, what we do is we assume there's two distinct ones, perhaps with different labelings, and then we conclude that they're equal. Right. So we'll assume to the contrary that there are two distinct prime factorizations of n. That means p1, p2, p3, da da da, da pk, those are all prime numbers. And q1, q2, da da da, ql are all prime numbers, such that n is a product of prime numbers written two different ways p1 through pk, and q1 through ql. Those are two distinct prime factorizations. If they are two distinct prime factorizations, you have to look carefully about what is the smallest thing that makes them distinct. It's not true that they are distinct if p1, equals q, p1 does not equal q1 and p2 does not equal q2 and so on. That's not sufficient of distinctness. That's too strong of a distinctness, of what it means to distinctness. When you take the negation of two prime factorizations being unique, what we mean is that for all i, uh, there is a pi, uh, excuse me, oh. That is important. Some pi does not equal any qj, right? Some factor of the, the original product is not equal to the other factors, right? Some pi does not equal any qj. Now, the reason we have to say any qj is because the primes can be written in any order. 2 times 3 is equal to 3 times 2. It's not, we're not assuming they're in sorted or anything like this, right? So some pi is not equal to any qj. Does this negation, does that clear up why this is the negation? Yeah. I'm just kind of confused where that uh, top right part was. I didn't realize that, oh. was that n is equal to, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah. But yeah, that helps. Yeah. Uh, there are several other proofs of this one, in fact. Um, this is the shortest one. Again, you want the shortest, most beautiful proof for everything. So, uh, any questions? All right. <laughs>